quite rightly, as you can see, the agenda is set for the next plenary, and uh, our next speaker will be dealing with the topic, quantifying the dividends of climate adaptation and resilience interventions projects, the case of guide project. Yes, the case of the guide project in Ghana. Our next speaker, by way of introduction, has been involved in the renewed development, implementation, evaluation, and commercial management of development projects or programs and infrastructure projects or programs, specifically in healthcare, roads and bridges, rail, mass housing, etc. Ladies and gentlemen, he is currently the Professor of Operations and Project Management and Director of Academic Staffing at Loughborough Business School in the UK. He had previously served as the Dean of the Business School between 2018 and 2020 and Deputy Rector 2020 to 2023 of the Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration, GIMPA, a Ghanaian public tertiary institution. Please, dealing with the topic that I've already mentioned, let's welcome Professor Martin Morgan Tooley. Please, let's give him a huge round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Already, I admire him so much because he's been outstanding with all the contributions and he's still wide awake. So I know this will definitely go well. Please, your audience. All right, good afternoon. I know I'm standing between you and sleep. Um, I'm going to try and make sure I don't bore you uh, to sleep. Um, as you probably know, one of the grand challenges we are dealing with as a society is climate change. And we can either adapt to climate change or we can mitigate climate change Adaptation generally means that we are trying, we are taking measures to cope with climate change. Mitigation means we are taking steps to try and reduce, uh, you know, carbon emission, which we know is the cause of uh, climate change. So today I'm talking about the adaptation, the coping side of it. Uh, and here I say interventions, but what I actually mean is uh, projects that are aimed at trying to help us cope uh, with uh, climate uh, uh, change. So I'm going to provide uh, a brief description of uh, the concept that we want to look at. I'll introduce the Garrett project, which is the case that I want to focus on, uh, and uh, how we went about doing this uh, uh, study. I'll then look specifically at the issues around uh, the cost and uh, dividends of the project and draw some conclusions uh, uh, from that. So um, what we know is that the cost of trying to adapt to climate change is far less than the cost of doing business as usual, uh, as uh, the former Secretary General of the UN uh, put it. And as you can see, uh, these are some examples of adaptation projects uh, at different parts of the world. And you can see to your right hand side uh, some information around the costs versus the benefits that you drive from uh, embarking on such projects. And you can see uh, that for projects such as uh, early warning systems, uh, you can drive uh, up to uh, 10 times uh, the cost that you put in uh, or the investment that you put in, uh, in in the adaptation. Um, so doing adaptation, you know, has a lot of uh, uh, rewards. Um, we also know that all right, we, we also know uh, that although um, investing in resilience or adaptation uh, brings a lot of rewards, there are many reasons that prevent us from doing so, whether it's the fact that uh, many investment in that sector do not bring money. We are spending money and it doesn't directly give us any cash flow. They also tend to be long-term and very complex uh, and so on. 
and some of the solutions we try to apply in adaptation are untested and so on. Uh, but what also becomes a problem is the kinds, the weak institutions we have, sometimes not being clear about what the benefits or incentives will come when you uh, do uh, these kinds of things uh, in terms of the uh, adaptation and so on. So what we are talking about here is a, a concept in trying to justify or make a good case for why certain projects uh, that are aimed at climate adaptation uh, might be required. So the concept I'm talking about here is a concept called the triple dividend of resilience uh, uh, approach, uh, which essentially, for those of you who are familiar with cost-benefit analysis, uh, is uh, an approach quite similar to cost-benefit analysis, but takes a much broader uh, perspective in terms of um, you know, what it considers in uh, determining what the benefits or the dividends of these projects are. And it considers these benefits in three broad categories. Uh, the first is what we call avoided losses. So if the project were not implemented, what damage will uh, disasters and so on cause? So for example, if we don't do a sea defense wall and uh, you know, the, the sea levels go up, what damage will it cause both for property and for life uh, and so on? Then the second uh, part is the kinds of induced economic uh, and environmental, uh, economic and development benefits that undertaking that project might bring. So for example, if certain interventions are done to make areas which were flood prone, no longer flood prone, then it will spare some development. People will build houses there, they will build businesses there, and it will make businesses that are there safer and so on. So what kinds of economic and development benefits will you get by implementing that project? And then the third category is to look at any environmental and social benefits that might come as a result of the project uh, being implemented. So we can see that the potential losses that will come if certain climate interventions are not done, we are always normally able to quantify uh, what we can save in terms of property and in terms of life. Uh, what is always less uh, or more difficult to quantify are always the benefits that will come as a result of uh, induced economic and, and uh, development as well as the uh, environmental and social uh, uh, benefits that will come from, uh, from that. So we, we also know that the, uh, the second and third benefits, which are the ones from induced economic and development as well as social and uh, environmental, whether the projects are implemented or not, uh, those benefits, whether a design always uh, come. But we also know that uh, the benefits that we get when we implement climate change uh, adaptation uh, projects are often larger than we know or can actually quantify. And, you know, they always outstrip all the probabilities that we will uh, predict uh, and, and so on. So, Part of what uh, we are talking about here is how can you quantify the benefits that will come if you implement these large uh, climate adaptation projects. And the benefit of doing that is that you are then able to make a case for projects that are viable. Because if the cost benefit analysis shows that a project will not have benefits that outstrip the costs, then no one will invest in those projects. And if I, governments I, who normally will not have I, I, the money will need to borrow that money to, uh, for such projects, they need to make sure that uh, the investment they are going to make will actually bring benefits that will outstrip whatever cost uh, they will incur. So how do we go about doing uh, the three benefits that I, I've talked about? 
work First, that we need to uh, conduct some form of estimations or quantification uh, of these benefits across the three areas that we've talked about. We also need to determine how much the project is going to cost. Uh, and to then, on the basis of that, we can always calculate what the benefit to cost ratios are what the net present value is and so on in order to uh, uh, determine what these benefits are. And we then group all the benefits that will come uh, to the project in those three categories, whether they are uh, avoided losses, whether they are going to induce some economic benefits, or whether they will be social or environmental uh, benefits. Now, as you know, some of these data can always be available, and some you need to either collect, uh, do some data collection, and the last session was talking about collecting uh, data and processing that data. That's essentially what we are, uh, you often need to do. In some cases, you might need to make certain estimates or projections uh, based on similar yeah. projects in order to get the data you need uh, 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 to do that. Then you also need, because some of these projects are long-term, some 30 years, 50 years, and so on, you, you want to determine what the present value or the present value of the money is, so you need to do some kind of discounting uh, and, and so on. And what we have uh, come to know is that low discount rates are always preferable in part and because these and projects are long term and, and so on. And if you don't get the discount rates uh, uh, correct or properly, uh, it might show that your projects are not really uh, uh, viable uh, and so on. And you can see an example of what the impact of choosing uh, different types of uh, discount rates can have on the viability of your project. So you see, this is a, uh, an example of a project where the initial investment is about hundred million dollars uh, and the benefits that the projects are having uh, are different. One is having about 10 million benefit every year over the 30 year period. Another having 20 million over 10 year period. And you can see, depending on what discount rate is chosen, it might show the project as viable or not. So the uh, discount rates that are selected play a huge role in determining which projects can be viable uh, or not. And therefore, we need to take that into account when we are doing these kinds of uh, analysis. So it was is the basis of this that we uh, did an assessment of what is called the Garage Project. And Garage stands for Greater Accra Resilience and Integrated Development Project, which uh, is specifically being implemented to deal with some of the flooding uh, and, and uh, disaster issues uh, within uh, Accra. So its objective is to improve flat uh, risk management and solid weight ma uh, management around the Odor, uh, River, uh, Odor River Basin area, those of you who are familiar with Accra, and also to improve some of the basic infrastructure that will allow uh, for uh, communities to, to thrive uh, better and so on. Um, just some maps. Uh, to give a sense of where uh, these uh, projects actually are. But you see there are several dates that are highlighted there, and those are some of the recorded disaster days in the history of this area of Accra. Um, and I think most of you will recall the June 3rd uh, uh, rains and floods and the disaster that uh, caused. So the statistics uh, from that is that you know, 152 lives were lost, and you can see the level of damage to property and how much it costs to uh, to deal with that. And all these uh, projects, uh, or this garage project is an attempt to try and deal with those uh, issues. So you can see pictures of what the current state uh, uh, is, and some of the uh, proposed, uh, or what the project will potentially achieve. So the first part of the project will deal with uh, drainage and flood mitigation uh, measures. Uh, the second part of the project will deal with solid uh, waste management. And the last part will deal with upgrading uh, some targeted communities uh, and, and so on. So what we essentially then did was to determine what will be the cost and the benefits of implementing these three uh, uh, areas of the uh, of the project. 
So what we essentially did is a case study uh, where we adopted looking at certain secondary data, whether it's reports that have been prepared to justify the project and doing some estimation. We also conducted some form of interviews and validation of some of the information and essentially then grouped uh, the costs and also the benefits that this project is uh, projected uh, uh, to have. As I said, discounts rates are an important element of doing an exercise like this. So what we tried to do was to also assess what the impact would be if we use different discount rates in the analysis. And we specifically chose uh, discount rates around 3%, 5%, and 8% to uh, assess uh, the uh, to discount the benefits uh, and the costs of the project. Now, as I said earlier, choosing the right discount rates are particularly important because uh, this particular project is projected uh, to bring benefits over, uh, you know, a 50-year uh, period, uh, and therefore low discount rates because of, of that and some of the justifications for. Uh, you know, low discount rates uh, are there. I'm going to skip through that uh, basically. So what did we find by assessing this project? So the first is looking at how much will this project actually cost? And to determine that, we looked at various things to do with construction costs, operations and maintenance costs, what contingencies they have in place, uh, certain design studies and supervision, as well as some of the resettlement costs that will be incurred uh, in the course of the uh, project. So by doing that, as I indicated, the project is in three parts. Uh, one is around uh, drainage and flood mitigation, and that is the highest component of the cost for the project, uh, $162 million. Uh, then solid waste management and capacity issues, about $55.2 million. And then the issues around upgrading communities are around about $58.8 million. So in total, this project is projected to cost uh, $276 million uh, to undertake. So that is the cost uh, component of the project. So we then went ahead to try and also determine what would be the benefits if we then divided it over the three categories that we, we talked about. So the first is avoided uh, losses, which is simply says that if the project were, if this project is not undertaken, how much loss in terms of life and property will occur over the next 50 years? Yeah, so loss of property, loss of uh, uh, life and so on. So this uh, analysis is based on how much damage will be caused in this particular area over the next 50 years if this project were not to be undertaken. Uh, and we also looked at loss of life as uh, and uh, property and so on. And based on some of the uh, exercise or analysis, it was estimated that about 48% uh, uh, or the, the interventions are estimated to mitigate less than even 50% of uh, uh, the damage, but also that about 40% of the economic assets in that area are actually in danger uh, uh, if these floods actually uh, occur. And as I said, we did the analysis by using the three uh, discount rates uh, uh, to look at that. So when we did the analysis of the uh, estimated uh, avoided losses. Uh, if we use the trade discount rates, we are talking about uh, 370 million. If we were using an 8% discount rate, uh, nearly a billion uh, dollars if we're using 5% and 1.7 billion if we're using a 3% discount rate. So of course, as you can see, lower discount rates will give you a much viable uh, project. But it's important to, uh, to indicate that irrespective of what discount rate we actually use, it shows that based on just avoided losses alone, that at least the benefits will outstrip the cost of investing in, in, in the project. 
Then we also looked at some of the induced economic and development benefits that will come uh, by uh, implementing the project, and specifically looking at issues around uh, disruptions to businesses and to transportation if the disaster or these disasters were to actually be allowed uh, uh, to, to occur and how much uh, that will actually cost businesses or how much businesses will be saving as a result of the project uh, being implemented. Again, on the basis of that, uh, the induced economic uh, development in that area was estimated at 59 uh, million, another 149.9 .9 million if we were using a 5% discount and also uh, you know, 282 if we were uh, you know, using a 3%. Now, as you can see, if we're using 8% and 5% discount rates, it will show that these projects will not be viable on only the economic benefits that we'll get uh, from uh, uh, the project. Now, the other component we also looked at are the social and environmental benefits uh, that will occur as a result of uh, implementing the project. And of course, this is always an area that is very uh, difficult to assess. And as a result, there have be very few uh, research done around uh, these. But we looked at some of the benefits that will arise from improvement or enhancing biodiversity or con uh, conversation, uh, conservation in the area. We also looked at uh, things around uh, what kind of uh, reduction in disease burden that will occur as a result of uh, the project. We also looked at issues around uh, providing a cleaner environment and the health benefits that might come from there and other welfare uh, benefits. Another aspect that we looked at was that the project was actually going to reduce uh, carbon uh, uh, you know, emissions in the area. And based on the analysis we did, about uh, 24.9 million uh, uh, tons of uh, uh, carbon will be uh, reduce if the project is implemented. So on the basis of that, we try to uh, find how much does carbon actually cost. And the World Bank provides some information for uh, carbon costs. Uh, they provide a low and high and average uh, cost. But we also know that across Africa, the only place where there is a carbon market is in South Africa. And they currently uh, cost carbon at about $10.09 uh, uh, per ton. So if that volume of carbon emission is going to be reduced, how much would that work out to be? So what, what we also did with the social and environmental benefits is then to say, because we are not sure how much uh, carbon will cost, whether it will be at the low side or at the high side or average side or the African uh, cost, we decided to show the cost for the four scenarios. Whether we go with the low figure, the average figure, the high figure, or the South Africa uh, uh, cost. Just to give a sense of um, you know, what level of benefits we could be talking about. So if we were going with the low uh, level, the social and environmental benefits in total, not just the carbon alone, but including all the other benefits we talked about, will be about two. Uh, 262 for the 8%, 278 for uh, 5%, and 302 million for, for that. And as you can see, again, at 8%, this project won't be viable if we're taking only this benefit. If we look at the, uh, you know, the first one I showed was using the South Africa figure. If we use the low uh, uh, figure, then you'll see that the projects are not viable uh, unless we get a high price for uh, carbon. And if we look at the, uh, you know, the average, then the project seems viable because that's at a higher cost for carbon. And if we then look at even the, uh, you know, the high uh, price of carbon, then it really shows that the project will be very viable, but it's unlikely that we'll be able to uh, get this high level for uh, uh, carbon cost. So if we now bring all the three benefits that we have looked at, the avoided losses, induced economic uh, and development benefits, as well as the social and environmental uh, benefits, 
uh, we will see that our project, uh, you know, shows. So as I said, we looked at three discount scenarios, but we also looked at four uh, prices at which we could sell carbon for, or the carbon emissions uh, uh, could be. And those will be the range of uh, benefits that we could get uh, uh, from implementing uh, uh, the project. So there are a number of things that we can draw uh, lessons from uh, this project. First, we know from the analysis that the Garrett project is going to cost about 276 million. We also know that depending on what we do uh, in terms of discount rates and in terms of uh, what price we get for carbon, we could be getting a total benefits from this project of between 451 uh, million in terms of total uh, benefits to about $6.3 billion in terms of total benefits. So on that account alone, if governments can make a justification for this project to go ahead because the cost benefits are, uh, or the benefit to cost ratios are much higher uh, than one. We also see that the net present value that we'll get depending on what assumptions we make in terms of discount rates and as well as cost of carbon, that those will also be between 175 million and uh, 5.9 billion. We also uh, know that on the basis of the Gary project, the benefit to cost ratio, which is one of the metrics we use to determine if a project is viable or not, shows that uh, we could get a, a benefit to cost ratio between 1.64 and 22.72 uh, uh, benefit to cost ratio. Essentially say, uh, showing that irrespective of what discount rate or what carbon price we get, the total benefits of this project uh, will outstrip the cost of implementing the project in terms of the, the trade uh, benefits that we've talked about. But of course, we know that some of these uh, uh, benefits are uh, either estimated or simulated. So data availability is a key issue in determining uh, uh, some of these things. Also, there are certain benefits that we are not able to quantify, or we don't even know that those benefits will come by implementing the project. So we won't be able to take those into account. But what we, we know is that even uh, at the planning stage, at least we have enough data to say the project will be viable. If the project is implemented, we can come back to this uh, uh, assessment and do it over a period of time to determine whether these figures actually stack up or the project even brings better benefits uh, than uh, we, 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 we are estimating uh, uh, at this point. Um, again, most, uh, as we know, cost-benefit analysis will always do the avoided losses for uh, climate change uh, projects. But what we've also shown here is that if we also assess the induced economic benefits as well as the social and environmental benefits, those can actually add up to make projects even much more uh, you know, feasible and, and make them viable to invest in and for governments to be able to make a case uh, to seek funding for those kinds of projects. And the uh, induced economic benefits as well as the social environment can actually improve the benefit to cost ratio of the projects between 22% to about 1,500%. Uh, so um, it therefore shows that using a much broader uh, framework to determine what benefits might come from uh, climate intervention projects uh, will go a long way to uh, uh, making projects viable. And lastly, from a developing country context, this is one of the first studies to look at uh, quantifying the benefits and the costs of climate change projects by applying the model that we've, we've looked at. And therefore, it shows that uh, there is some promise and uh, government seeking funding can use this model to assess their projects and to make a case for why we need to invest uh, in climate change uh, adaptation so that you know, we can continue to cope with the effects of climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And also thank you for staying in time. Another round of applause, please.
bring insights into the Garrett project. Uh, we'll take two questions, if there be any. Please, you may put up your hand and I'll come to you. Yes. Wow, great. Prof, well done, Prof. This is Ola from Takradi. And uh, sincerely speaking, Prof, I would like you to involve me in this project. Please, please, it's very interesting. Yeah. Now, look at the analysis that you have given us. In fact, it's a laudable project. And uh, from the carbon emission and the analysis you have done, using South Africa costs, uh, I think I want to know how is the carbon going to be extracted or generated since the project is going to reduce carbon emission and we know it's an environmentally pro I mean, friendly project because we know that you know the climate change and what have you, we have been trying to see how the ozone layer has been depleted and what solution can be done to that, which I believe this project is a great one. So my much interest is I want you to inform me in the project if you see the light of the day. So I have to reiterate it. Yes. So I believe, Prof, you know Ola. You've been hearing of Ola from Takradi. Oh, yes, because I've been hearing of you very well. Uh -huh. So please. <laughs> so, Prof, to, to expand more on this carbon emission, I believe, looking at the cost analysis you have done, let's present follow up. Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. I'm not sure anyone can say no to a pitch like that. <laughs> I'll take um, another question here before you answer. Please. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. I have uh, two questions. The, the first one is, I was trying to understand why you had uh, multiple discount rates. I, th I thought typically it will be determined by the, your cost of funding. Okay. So, okay. And the next one, the next one is, is it always easy to quantify the social and environmental bit? Okay. So let, let me start with the last question. As I said, uh, quantifying some of the benefits is impossible. And it's particularly harder to quantify uh, the cost uh, the benefits when it relates to social issues. So one of the things, for example, we did in uh, quantifying some of the environmental benefits is by undertaking this project, how much will you improve sanitation such that it will reduce health costs or reduce uh, the sickness load for people living in the area? And if you then work out on average how much people spend on healthcare and by how much you can reduce that, we can work out how much the savings will be over the 50-year uh, 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 period. So those are examples of how uh, uh, we, we try and, and quantify uh, uh, those ones. Now, on the issue of the discount rates, uh, the cost of borrowing goes into the cost of the project. So that is not what you use to, to determine uh, uh, a discount uh, uh, rate. It's not necessarily uh, that actually related to how much you are borrowing uh, for, because how much you, the percentage at which you are borrowing for goes into the cost of uh, uh, the total borrowing uh, you, you will have. But what we are, we, are, we are trying to determine is, what is the present value of, let's say, $10 million benefit that will come in 2050? What is the present value? What is the present, uh, you know, value of that money today, if, if we were discounting it to, uh, to, to this uh, date. So in fact, some actually argue that for projects like this, because of the long duration of the projects and because of the potential that you can actually even get benefits far outweighing uh, the cost, you should even be doing a zero uh, discount rate because that also improves. Uh, that means that you are value valuing uh, longer term benefits today more if you lower the discount rate. We also wanted to show that using different discount rates can show or can prove that your project is either viable or not viable. Yeah, and in many uh, countries and inside projects, they're actually using discount rates less than 
to to determine the present value uh, of, of the money. Uh, in, in developing countries, they tend to go a bit higher, less than 10% in all. So we just wanted to demonstrate how different discounts rates will show in terms of uh, uh, the benefits that we've discounted to, uh, to today. On the first question around the carbon uh, uh, reduction, now you will realize that a lot of the carbon emissions are coming from waste, burning of waste. Yeah, so if you see the uh, waste sites uh, in most cities, they are emitting a lot of smoke and therefore a lot of carbon. So one of the parts of this project around the solid uh, uh, waste management is using very environmentally friendly way to burn the, uh, the waste and therefore reduce the amount of uh, smoke that will go into the air and therefore the amount of carbon. So in order to assess that, what we did then was to say, using these new technologies, how much smoke will be, emit, uh, will be emitted from burning uh, uh, the waste versus how much uh, smoke or carbon is being emitted using the current methods of just openly burning the waste. By comparing those two, you can then determine how much reduction in uh, carbon uh, will occur as a result of that. There is also a lot of vegetation uh, that will come as a result of the project. And if you saw the pictures of some of the projected ways in uh, which that area will look like, there is a lot of vegetation, trees and uh, grass and so on. And those also absorb a lot of uh, carbon. So we are also looking at how much uh, carbon would such vegetation and trees also absorb. And that gave a total of about 24 million tons of reduction in carbon. So that is, uh, this is just an example of some of the ways in which we determine how much uh, carbon emission will occur. And on the basis of that, as I said, we then decided that the World Bank provides these figures for carbon costs. We don't know how much uh, this will potentially cost in Ghana because we have not set up a carbon market yet. The only related one in Africa is in South Africa and they currently value carbon at 10 uh, tons, uh, $10 uh, per ton. So if we use that as a basis, then we might not expect that the Ghana carbon market will uh, cost more than the South African one, maybe around the same level. But it could also be as low as the 0 0.49, which is the lowest carbon uh, price in the world that the World Bank currently records. So it was on the basis of that, we also wanted to show how much that carbon will cost depending on which one we actually go with and what effect it will have on the benefit to cost ratios uh, of these uh, uh, projects. So that was essentially what we did. All right. Okay. Thank, Thank you me. very much, Professor Tuli. A huge round of applause. Please, you stand here while I call on the president of PMI Ghana, Mr. Uswa Samwa, to do this presentation. Oh, please, let's appreciate the president. This is a plenary speaker certificate to Professor Martin Morgan Tooley, please. Nicely done. Please another round of applause while they take their seats.